the big story with Hurricane Otis is that it went from being kind of a tropical storm to being a Category 5 hurricane in about six hours. And then it made landfall in Acapulco at a Category 5 hurricane. And no hurricane forecasting models had predicted this. And hurricane forecasting models are what are you know typically run off of ensemble models, meaning that there are multiple things that may happen. And that those simulations are run on very compute intensive systems. And there are many, many simulations being run all the time. Every six hours, these simulation runs are done. And then you look at these and you create a probability of things that may happen. And none of the forecasts had any probability associated with this event happening. It was so out of the bounds of anything we have seen historically that none of the models had any chance ascribed to this tropical storm suddenly evolving into a Category 5 hurricane in six hours and then making landfall on a city with a million people. We can look at pictures if you guys want and what happened in Acapulco. It's obviously pretty devastating. There's apparently no power line standing in the entire region. Here's some photos. Oh I mean, look God. at this. Like, wow. 165 mile an hour sustained winds. The eye wall went through the, the town. It's a, a million people, by the way, many of whom live in not concrete reinforced buildings up against the mountain there. And so the devastation is really extraordinary. But the, the shocking thing is that there was no prep. There was no warnings. There was no alerts. There were a ton of tourists sitting in these hotels. Look at the, I don't know if you have any of the hotel photos, Nick, but it's insane. There are zero windows left in any of the hotels, any of the condos, any of the resorts. They are gone. So imagine you're, you're like in Acapulco, you're drinking beer and tequila, and then you go to sleep and this thing hits at 1 a.m. as a category five hurricane and destroys everything. There's no power, there's nothing. So if you pull up the first chart, most of the energy that, that is absorbed from the sun ends up in our oceans. So, you know, we talk about atmospheric carbon increasing energy retention, and people can debate that all they want, where the carbon comes from, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, there is energy coming into the earth from the sun, and that energy is being retained. The vast majority of that energy is retained by the oceans. So the first couple hundred meters of the oceans re uh, retain north of 90% of the energy uh, absorbed by Earth. If you go to the next slide, so that results in water temperatures going up. So if you look at, um, this is compared to the, the uh, 1955 to 2006 average, and you can measure ocean heat content, but ocean heat content has risen fairly linearly since the 90s, and you can kind of see, uh, you know, how much excess is that uh, heat correlated to temperature perfectly or no? So this is ocean temperatures over time. Uh, so here you can see 2023. And so this shows you um, the average sea surface temperature. So 2023 has been such an outlier. And this is also because of these um, El Nino phenomena. But th there's obviously over time, if you were to look at the average sea surface temperature trend, it's rising linearly with heat content over time. And in particular, in 2023, there's an extraordinary rise in temperature. So off the coast of Acapulco, the sea surface temperature was 88 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, it was so hot, the water, like imagine an 80, that's like a David Sachs swimming pool. It's so warm, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, going down many meters in the ocean. So when a storm goes over that level of heat, it takes heat out of the ocean, and that heat coming out of the ocean increases the wind speed and then it, the wind speed pulls more heat out of the ocean. And that's how these things become escalatory until they hit something cold, like a mountain or the, the, the land, the land is much cooler. And then these things start to dissipate and break apart. And that's why these things form over the ocean. So the point is, no models predicted this. And that's because we've never seen this level of energy stored in the oceans before. And the model training has never really accounted for this sort of extreme condition. This extreme condition, obviously, is, is what some folks are arguing is becoming more frequent. So it brings into question, you know, the, this, this, this um, ability for us to actually forecast the, the rise in the temperature over time is driving this. Um, and then, oh, from an economic perspective, this is the, one of the key points I wanted to make. When an event like this happens, there's a market called the reinsurance market. And the reinsurance market sets the price for covering insurance companies against a big loss, where you can lose a ton of stuff at once. Insurance companies like to write insurance policies like car insurance is a great business because there's never one big event that causes everyone to get in an accident on the same day. But with property insurance, a hurricane can cause everyone to lose on the same day. So insurance companies need to buy reinsurance. And then there's these big reinsurance companies and they have pools of capital and there's capital markets involved and bonds that are sold to protect reinsurance. 
So there's, you know, hundreds of billions of, of dollars, trillion dollar plus in reinsurance. When an event like this happens, those reinsurance markets take a loss. And the loss causes them to raise rates significantly. And, it's, and when that happens, the reinsurance markets harden, is what they say. And then rates go up next year for reinsurance. And then the insurance companies pass those rates on to consumers and to property developers and to the people that have mortgages. And the more of these events happen, even though it just happened in Acapulco, it impacts insurance rates everywhere. So as we see the events like what happened in Maui, what happened in Acapulco, what happened in Miami, you can start to see more of these things start to happen at the same time, the cost for insuring property goes up. And that starts to make this whole system very difficult to maintain because if the cost for insurance doubles or triples and people can't really afford it, but the mortgages require that they have it in all of these high risk coastal cities and coastal areas, that's where an economic hit either has to be absorbed by the federal government or we end up taking a mass or, or we take a massive insurance, right? Or we take a massive economic loss. And so yeah. I just want to say, like, this seems like an outlier event, and oh my gosh, we should be sorry and sad. But the truth is, the frequency of these events and the risk factors, which is this ocean heat temperature rising continuously for a long period of time, are going to drive that frequency of events. And there's going to be a real economic cost to bear on the order of several trillion dollars over time, because someone has to underwrite that real estate and someone has to underwrite the insurance to support that real estate. So it may seem like a one off and oh, you know, this won't be a big deal. But it actually translates economically through the reinsurance and insurance markets into the real estate markets fairly quickly. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of point out one of the, the, the second order consequences. Of there was an article in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago, Nick, you can probably find it about this exact issue where they profiled the handful of homeowners, I think it was in Palm Beach or West Palm Beach. And they essentially had to sell and leave because they couldn't afford the home insurance. Or for those that own their home outright, they just stopped insuring it because they realized the land value would be fine. And so they said, if a storm, there it is, if a storm hits, oh, there you go. Yeah. if a storm hits, you know, West Palm and, and destroys my home, you know, hopefully I'll be fine. And then I'll just leave and I'll just sell it for the dirt. But to your point, it's become economically untenable in a lot of places for these folks to be able to insure insure their home look at this on this example a hundred and twenty one thousand dollars a year for home insurance what right. what how's that possible by, by the way so add up the value well that's because there's a one in ten chance that a hurricane's going to hit them on any given year right and then they yeah. lose their whole value so do the math on what the total real estate value in that region is and think about what it gets written gets written down to as everyone starts to sell and then you do that across all these regions where there's now high risk and lack of insurance available. And you have a real economic question on who's going to step in to support and buoy th those asset values. Now, but aren't there state actors now that step in and act as a reinsurer? Great question. In Florida, they have a reinsurance pool that is largely assumed to be completely underfunded. And so everyone says like Florida's got this reinsurance pool, they'll write your stuff. But right. the Florida, if people, if you ask people in the reinsurance industry, they're like, this thing's basically bankrupt. It's completely insolvent. This isn't real. So the federal government's going to be asked to step in and cover that thing at some point. And then someone's got to write a trillion dollar check. I mean, you know, you want to complain about sending 100 billion to Ukraine and Israel. Wait until most of the country has to underwrite coastal communities, real estate values. So Silicon yeah. Valley actually needs to be pro climate change so that you can reinflate the money supply. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, and then the other, the other, I mean, how, second no, order but is, I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, but I'm kind of not. It's really crazy that so many industries, it, it, I think Sachs said it really, really quite perfectly. When the money supply is shrinking, there's just a lot less money to go around. When the money supply is growing, it's much easier for all of us to grab a share of it. And now that it's shrinking, you have this weird effect where you actually want government intervention, which unfortunately only happens in acute tragedies and calamities. And so what are we hoping for now as a society? That's a very scary idea. The second effect is who, who's going to buy these homes if they can't be insured, right? Isn't that going to crash home prices, Freiburg? That's my point is that yeah. these assets aren't worth what they're currently marked at. And if yeah. you add up all of the real estate assets in all of these different regions, that you know, everyone assumes are worth X. But the only reason mm. they're worth X is because they're insured. And if they're not insured, people are gonna have to start to sell them. And if they can't afford the insurance, they're gonna have to start selling them. Then the real value starts mm. to come out. These sorts of events like Acapulco are catalyzing events for forcing the market to rewrite this stuff. Yeah. That's, this is the beginning of a cascading effect.